Today we're talking about, potentially, the most expensive election of 2018. Because it was recently announced that For many Iraqis, their vote is the most powerful weapon. Those who chose to come are voting for change. Yeah, not to be that guy, but really? Change? The country that's been a country for less than a year after ISIS invaded and took over the majority of it, and one of the first things the voters want to try to do is change the government? So why are people reporting this? Maqtada al-Sadr, a militia leader who once led a charge against American troops in Iraq, has emerged as the front runner in Iraq's national elections. Oh no! See guys, this is why you don't fight to put representative democracies in regions that hate you. Why do democracies always have to represent the will of the people? Hey, at least we can say with relative confidence that the US didn't rig it. Although we probably just forgot to set a Google alert for that one and in between North Korea and Michael Cohen, just kinda slipped through the cracks. Alright, so what does this guy stand for? Because the way it's being reported here, if you can find a report on it, it's being treated as though Iraq voted for the guy who could yell death to America the loudest. When in reality, it turns out that while his anti-American past probably didn't hurt, some of his other policies might have helped him more. So let's meet Iraq's new leader. Fair warning, this guy is a radical, but not in the way you're thinking. Some Iraqis, the satirists included, argue that the solution is to form a technocratic government, which is to say, a government that is run by experts and technicians rather than politicians. Wait, so you're telling me that having politicians run agencies isn't the best idea? Someone tells Scott Pruitt who hasn't updated his LinkedIn to say he's the head of the EPA. Gee, I wonder why. Maybe it's because his summary still describes him as a leading advocate against the EPA's activist agenda. So what the heck happened there? That would be like leaders of Occupy Wall Street looking around one day to find themselves the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Wait, what happened? Dang, that stuff really is strong. So I could see how someone would want to appoint experts to positions where they would be overseeing the entity they're an expert in. I could also see how this would be appealing considering that Iraq was rated the 11th most corrupt country by Transparency International. And sorry you didn't make the top 10, but I could see how you wouldn't be thrilled with standard politicians running things. Now I couldn't get any solid information on appointments yet, considering that this election happened a few days ago, but he has been advocating for a technocracy in Iraq since Iraq became a democracy. Technocracies are strange though, because finding an example of a pure technocracy is very controversial. Some people say China's a technocracy, while others say that what you need to advance there is just party loyalty and not a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. There was one recent technocratic example that did surprise me though. Italy in 2011 under Mario Monti. So briefly, let's travel back to 2011. Ha <laughs> ha Well, those are six reasons why Bitcoin is only a small fad and won't make it to 2012. Anyways, today we're talking about Italy because their leader, Mario Monti, is charged with bringing Italy, the most indebted country in the EU, out of their economic hardship. He has set up a 17 member cabinet in charge of creating policies to deal with the debt led by professors and economists, and putting in charge of the country's development the CEO of Italy's largest retail bank. So what happened? Well, They came up with great ideas the same way your friend has an idea for a great app. It turns out that politicians are important because these unknown technocrats couldn't push anything through the Italian government. And at one notorious point, the employment and welfare minister burst into tears during a live press conference when discussing human costs of austerity measures. Oh geez, that is not what you want to see from any politician discussing your country's economic outlook. Back to you, future Stephen. I have to go cover the peaceful democratic uprising going on in Syria. 
Isn't it inspiring? So yes, Sauter is a technocrat, but he's radical in more ways than that. Brace yourself, Republicans, because you're not going to like this. He has formed a coalition with the communists. Oh no, an Arab Muslim communist? Also known to Fox News as an Obama. So what does that mean? Well, since 2003, him and his party have provided healthcare services, food, and clean water to the poorest suburbs of Iraq. So he might have won less on a death to America platform and more on a life to Iraq platform. Again, the optics were terrible for his opponents when it came to casting votes. Because while he voted wearing traditional clothing in a poor district of a town, they were all in suits casting their votes in the green zone. Which, come on, are you even trying to win? I'm sure if you asked nicely, the US would at least help you fake a photo op voting in the middle of nowhere. If we can make Donald Trump seem like the advocate for the everyman, I'm pretty sure we can do it for you too. Now, there's been a topic that I've been skirting around to talk about his political positions, but I need to address. Muqtada al Sadr and his militia, the Mehdi Army, or JAM in American military short, and have been America's most intractable opponents in Iraq. al Sadr isn't exactly a friend to the American people or the Sunnis. He declared a jihad against coalition forces in Iraq in 2004. Although at that time, that was the trendy and expedient thing to do even if it might hurt you politically later. Kinda like voting to go to war in Iraq a year earlier. He also, in a strange yet very communist move, issued a fatwa temporarily allowing for theft in the form of looting after the fall of Saddam Hussein, as long as the looters give a percentage of the proceeds to the satirist movement, which did help expedite the redistribution of wealth. To get a little history on him, after 2003 we saw The Mahdi army appeared after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. al Sadr used it to launch a series of uprisings against the Americans. This was in their stronghold of Sada City in October 2004. In an odd and hopefully no way telling occurrence, Sadr City used to be called Saddam City. Great. Before we go on though, I want to emphasize Sadr hated Saddam, and with good reason. Saddam killed his father and two brothers for preaching an anti-Saddam pro-Shia message. Then in 2006... But then al-Sadr agreed to work with the Washington-backed government of Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. That cooperation lasted until April, when five of al-Sadr's followers resigned from the cabinet. They're demanding a resolution setting a timetable for US troop withdrawal. He was brought back into the fold, working with the Shiite majority government. Unfortunately, the US government wasn't ready to leave at that point. I mean, we had just figured out what the difference between Sunnis and Shiites was. This led him to get fed up and leave again, considering that for as long as the US has been in Iraq, he's been subtly dropping hints that it might be time for the US to go. Less checking his watch and going, ah, it's getting late, and more physically throwing us out and changing the locks. This led him to, in 2007, flee to fellow Shiite country Iran for fear of assassination, at which time I'm sure he was exposed to a more pro-American perspective. Then in 2011 it was reported, Shia cleric Muqtada al Sadr has returned to Iraq after nearly four years of self-imposed exile in Iran. Now, fleeing to a foreign country because sharing your specific beliefs in that country is less dangerous has led some to logically speculate, huh, maybe Iran will have undue influence over this person. And for what it's worth, there are two pieces of information you could point out to counter this argument. First, he ran for prime minister in a secular campaign and gained support from Iraqis fed up with the system on both sides of the religious spectrum. Although, people say all sorts of crazy things when they're campaigning. I've always had a great relationship with the blacks. Unless the blacks are a white family, I have my doubts. Secondly, he has proclaimed himself to be proud of his Arab roots. Now this might get a little technical, but there's a difference between Iran Persian nationality and Iraq's Arab nationality. I'd get into more detail on it, 
but I've met enough Persians and Arabs to know that the smallest mistake in my comment section will turn into a novel. Now, one final quick piece to know about this election. Despite the way everyone, including me up to this point, is reporting it, Al Sadr isn't actually Prime Minister. He never submitted the paperwork to run. Instead, this was a sweeping victory for the Sadrist movement, although he has a fair amount of influence with them, considering no one's thinking, huh, who controls the Sadrists? Probably not that politically active guy whose last name is Sadr. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. If you want to support nonpartisan comedic reporting, please subscribe to my channel and remember to like below. Thank you for watching.